Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Update for the week. In this one, we have some pretty good stories, like actually some good news in it, because there's a few cool things going on in the industry right now. One of them is a transparent Steam Deck shell, which is just kind of fun and a throwback to the old days, like the old transparent Game Boys. Also, 12 volt 2x6 is an updated version of the 12 volt high power standard. It's the same overall design, except improved with some of the things that actually we said we wanted seven months ago in our original investigation in this. But that timeline is about what it takes to actually roll out a product change. So we'll be talking about that. Uh, some of it will be familiar to those of you who watched our original two pieces. And then the R5 7500F, an AMD CPU that was accidentally leaked like four times in May, and no one noticed until recently. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly and the CryoSheet Graphene Pads. These CryoSheets are molecularly stacked in the Z-axis to encourage vertical direct thermal transfer from the IHS to the cooler. CryoSheet pads are made to be easily applicable for a thermal interface and completely avoid paste dryout because it's not paste. It makes them particularly useful for lawn service life systems with minimal maintenance. They come in multiple sizes for suitability on the most common laptops and desktop CPUs, and you can learn more at the Thermal Grizzly Cryo Sheets at the link in the description below. Up first, that AMD documentary we did, that was super fun to work on. It went live on Saturday. If you haven't seen it, go watch it because it covers some of the really interesting labs like the Thermal Lab, Failure Analysis Lab, and we also went through the Brain Up Lab at AMD's Austin campus. There's a ton more to see, of course, but we have another one of these lined up already, uh, the next one for Intel, and we're working on something hopefully for NVIDIA as well. It's a fun video, and if you haven't seen it, check it out. But if you have and you want more, we have some extra clips, basically cutting room floor stuff, conversations with some of the engineers that didn't make it into that piece. And uh, I'm gonna compile all those, probably clump them together in kind of a, a lazy edit of just here's the extra conversation and run it on GN Extras, where we have some of our additional footage if you haven't seen that channel. Either way, as part of a promo for that video going live and for us to kind of, I mean, basically celebrate it. It took us a long time to figure out the editing flow and collect all the footage and everything. We have a promo going on store.gamersaccess.net if you want to support our documentaries like that one. In addition to all of our testing we do, you can grab a mod mat, and if you buy one of the autographed models, we've had those on the store forever, there's a drop down, you can choose autographed or signed. This time, instead of only having my signature on it, I'm also signing them with Vitaly and with Mike on the team, both of whom joined me for the AMD factory tours or the lab tours. Uh, collected the footage for it and assisted with the editing, the parsing of the footage. And uh, so just to commemorate our time together as a team on that project, we're doing a special signing with the three of us. And if you buy an autograph to any mod map model, the, the large or the mediums on the store, then it will come with those two additional signatures as just a special memento and to help fund our next trip where we're gonna be doing this again. And we pay for all of our own travel with thanks to support from the community, buying things from our store or supporting us on Patreon. Projects was really fun though. It's some evergreen content. It's always relevant because it's just cool engineering stuff. You get to learn how these things are designed, tested and made. Uh, so our next steps, we're gonna be working on some reviews, getting back into the normal swing of things now that the, the full documentary piece is edited and behind us. And so you'll be seeing the standard reviews starting to pop back up again pretty soon. Uh, within the next couple weeks or so. Okay, first stories for the week. Gigabyte accidentally leaking the Ryzen 3 5100 CPU. This is another AM4 CPU. So 5600X3D, apparently not actually the last call for AMD AM4 CPUs. Maybe this one is. But the 5600X3D is a far more interesting one. Anyway, this was accidentally listed through the X570 Aorus Extreme Motherboards uh, spec page and the page lists some details for the R3 5100 as well. It's a CPU AMD hasn't, at least as of now, officially announced that it's a quad core. That is because it's a cut down Cezanne APU die, which itself only has 16 megabytes in total. This will really hamper the CPU's performance, especially compared to the normal Ryzen 3000 or 5000 series chips with 32 megabytes of L3. Despite being an APU die, the 5100 is listed as not having onboard graphics and it lacks the G suffix, which signifies as much. We don't plan to cover this one, but we'll see. Maybe it'll be interesting enough. 
Uh, it would need to launch in the DIY market, and it would have to be very cheap because, as a reminder, the 5600 now, it's $140. Uh, so the 5100 would have to come in pretty low end. But the 5300G is already out there. It's just, it's only in pre -built. And this appears to be basically a 5300G just without the graphics. We don't know if this is actually the final AM4 CPU, but it really doesn't seem like there are many more ways that AMD can dice up the remaining silicon into new products. So probably, but we've got the 5600X3D review online if you want to check that one out for what we, we thought was probably the last one. So the last, like, Good one, at least. Up next, Harukazi5719 on Twitter posted a tweet showing a CPU that's been hiding in the brush. And by, by brush, we mean like Puget Bench's benchmark results, and it's been there for months now. This is a 7500F. There are four results from May of this year for the 7500F. So that would put in the 7000 series, that means it's AM5. So it's not on the AM4 platform anymore. And it's listed as a six core processor. Its name doesn't match any existing SKUs. Compared to results on what looks like the same test bench, it seems like this new six core would be slightly slower than the existing 7600. We don't have a way to know the test conditions because we don't know where this result came from. So maybe don't pay too much attention to the numbers yet. The 7500F's existence is corroborated by this set of pictures that as far as we can tell, were also posted by Haro Kazi, but have since been deleted. The CPU in the photos looks like a legitimate production sample. Now, about a month ago, I'd actually heard from a board partner that a 7500F was on the way. So we know this one is, is true. We've basically confirmed it at this point. Uh, so you can consider those leaks, at least for the existence of it, accurate. We're not sure about the performance yet. But for what we know, the 7500F is supposed to be an IGP-disabled Ryzen 7000 CPU. Should make it a little cheaper, in theory, than, say, a 7600. Uh, and additionally, our understanding is that it is intended for a, a, an Asia-only launch. We don't know if that means China-only or just uh, Asia as a whole or some specific country. But it looks like it's going to be another limited launch, similar to the 5600X3D. Now, Specifically, China-only launches are not uncommon. These actually have happened a lot for AMD CPUs and for things like the GTX 1060 5 gigabyte, if anyone remembers that weird card. And that's because a lot of these types of CPUs end up in really specific builds, often for internet cafes, which are still very popular in parts of Asia. As a reminder, AMD moved to including IGPs and all of its initial Ryzen 7000 CPUs on AM5. So AMD probably doesn't want to confuse customers by using the same suffix as Intel, except with a different meaning. And using the F suffix makes sense if they're trying to align with Intel's meaning. Previous IGP per F designs from AMD used the G suffix, like 3400G, and removal of that suffix was what would signify the lack of an IGP. So now they're going to add in an F at the end, uh, which again aligns with Intel. That makes sense if these chips offer enough of the 7600's base performance, but can come in cheaper to remove that IGP. With Intel, you often see, say, a $20 or more basically discount off the price of the CPU by getting rid of it. And if all you do is gaming and you will basically never use an IGP except maybe for troubleshooting, it's a good way to save some money. Now, as for why these can exist, typically it's because a part failed validation. In this case, it would be the IGP, similar to how AMD stockpiled partially defective 5800X3Ds to become 5600X3Ds. So this is a normal part of trying to reclaim a lost basically yield from the wafer. It's a shame that it won't be more widely available, but it could be as simple as not having enough parts for a global launch or just targeting a market with different needs. Lowering the entry point for AMD for AM5 is pretty important at this point because AM4 is sort of the best budget option right now from AMD, the AM5 still being kind of on the expensive side. Uh, and Intel's got a 13100F that's about 100 bucks cheaper right now than the 7600 with the 13100F. It's only a quad core, but the point stands. AMD needs something in this category. Up next, as a quick story, ASRock has a super low profile A380 Intel Arc card it's bringing to the market. It's got a simple setup with an extruded aluminum heatsink and two small fans that have a zero RPM mode when the card's temperatures are low enough. There's also no power connector because the A380 can run on slot power alone. It's mostly unremarkable, and the main point here is the form factor. Low-profile cards are few and far between. 
but we like to see them for situations where you're trying to upgrade an old office PC or something similar. Speaking of, we should probably revisit the A380 sometime soon. It's been a while. We revisited the A750, A770. We've seen massive uplift, uh, and that should extend to the A380. So we'll try and take a look at it soon. The main thing we want to use it for is for acceleration of video editing, but it's still broken with Adobe Premiere for that purpose, unfortunately. Up next, the controversial 12 volt high power cable standard may be limited in days at this point because it's getting a revision. PCI SIG's been working on this since November, so, or actually maybe even before that. Back in November though, when we ran our second of the two 12 volt high power saga pieces, we talked about a couple of things. One of them was a shorter set of pins and another one was some of our wishes for improvements to the connector to help protect the end user. And we'll talk about those in a second. Eris from Hardware Busters has a great write-up on the new 12 volt two by six standard, which is the update to 12 volt high power. And uh, that's on his Hardware Busters site. We also interviewed him not long ago, if you wanna check that out. The new connector looks a lot like the original and in fact, it is backwards compatible. So they've been able to preserve that. If you have a power supply with 12 volt high power connectors, it will work with the going forward, the 12 volt two by six, which uh, we'll detail here for you in a second. And the same goes for older GPUs with newer cables. The biggest difference with 12 volt two by six is that the sideband or the sense pins have been shortened by one and a half millimeters. This makes it so the cable has to be fully seated in the connector for the sideband pins to make contact. When I read this, uh, my first reaction was, that sounds familiar. Uh, and I went back and checked, and this is almost exactly along the lines of what we said we wanted in our original two-part series. Now, one part of that was rumored to be under works, which was shaving the pins basically more or less in half. Uh, but the other part is one that we specifically asked for, which was a detection circuit in combination with short pins to help prevent any type of failures uh, that may cause melting or just poor contact in general. So here's a clip from that piece in November. Another thing that would help is if they implement a, a simple detection circuit, basically, that detects if it's seated or not. And that is doable, it's on cables. Back to present day, hand in hand with the shortened pins is in fact a change to add a detection circuit, some logic to the connection uh, on the PCIe card itself. So if the sideband sense pins aren't detected at all, no power is allowed to be drawn over the connector. This is a big deal because if the connector isn't fully inserted or if it backs out, which is what is happening in a lot of cases, this would act as a safety mechanism. And that's exactly why we were talking about it back then. Under the 12 volt high power spec, sense zero and sense one being open would still allow 150 watts to be drawn over the cable. This also means that for future instances where 150 watt mode is desired, those two sideband pins will need to be shorted to each other by either the cable or the power supply. Now this is the one situation we've found so far where there's a conflict between the original 12 volt high power and the revision 12 volt two by six in terms of compatibility. Uh, however, we don't think it should be a problem because we're looking over it and we haven't seen any power supplies on the market, at least to our knowledge, that have a cable that is specifically rated for only 150 watts. We have found some that are only rated for 300 watts. We haven't seen any below that. So it shouldn't be a problem. If for some reason you see a cable that also, for some reason, boldly prints on the side, 150 watt 12 volt high power cable, like some kind of giant brag about how good it is, don't buy it, just buy something better. But that would be the one area that'd be a big conflict. Other changes with the 12 volt two by six connector include lengthening the 12 main power and ground pins by 0.25 millimeters. That theoretically adds a tiny amount of extra safety margin and electrical contact while maintaining mechanical compatibility between the standards. The opening for the sideband pins is also being widened slightly, which we guess is to provide a marginally looser fit in that area to cut down the force required to plug the cable in. Now, there's really not a lot of room for error here between these designs because some of the adapters and cables on the market, like some of the earlier cable mod revisions, were specifically a little too loose, where they would more easily wiggle around and basically the connector and it can be a little easier to pull it loose as you're managing the cables, something we've covered in the past. So you have on one side, the connector is too tight and it becomes unclear sometimes how well it's seated. Uh, on the other side, it's too loose. Obviously, 
these are two very different problems on the same thing. Uh, but for at least the standard, as it's being defined for 12 volt 2 by 6, it should fit with a little bit less resistance, which would only be a non-issue if the cable was too loose originally, and most of them weren't. Most of them were too tight. But there's a fine line between loosening it up so that it actually will fit without uh, an excessive amount of resistance, so the user has good feedback to the connection, and making it so loose that it starts to work its way out, uh, and so the ideal solution there would be additional clips or security to hold the things together. Either way, there's one more really interesting piece to this story. Igor's lab discovered that this new connector, or one very close to it, has already been in use on the 4070 and 4060 Ti cards since launch. We additionally spoke with an off-record contact at ASUS, and we learned that ASUS has been starting to roll out this connector on its 4090s. As for Igor's findings, we confirmed those with our 4070 and our 4060 Ti samples as well. You can see how the small sideband pins are already visibly shorter on the Ti versus the older 4080 we had. Igor's lab also found this to be the case on at least one MSI 4070 and came across a user online claiming to have received the new connector on a recently purchased 4090. As far as NVIDIA's implementation, we're not sure if this is officially the new connector in every sense except for the official name, but certainly the pin shortening is the main aspect of it. Uh, and NVIDIA may be just implementing this as a stopgap to sort of hedge its bets while it waits on the official rollout from PCI SIG. Up next, ASUS is trying to find some good in the 4060 Ti. If you don't remember, for whatever reason, the 4060 Ti, but also the 4060 and the 7600 from AMD are eight lane <laughs> cards which is just really strange on the 4060 Ti. It's way too expensive to be getting away with that. Uh, but ASUS is trying to make some use of it. And what they're doing, because the footer is still a by 16 physical length, it's just by 8 wired for the GPU, is they are strapping an M.2 device to the card and using the other eight lanes. ASUS China's general manager, Tony Yu, showed this off in an RTX 4060 Ti, and ASUS is calling this the 4060 Ti 8G Plus 2T. This is a concept or prototype version of the ASUS dual design, like the one we got for our RTX 4060 non-Ti review. The SSD mounts onto the backside of the GPU underneath the removable section of the backplate, and when you think about it that way, they're sort of recovering the lanes that physically are already getting occupied anyway, and you can't just pull those from the slot if the slot is occupied and use them somewhere else. It's getting 16 PEG lanes, and it doesn't matter how many you use, they're going there. ASUS made an infomercial-style pitch of how difficult it can apparently be to access the top M.2 slot when a large air cooler and GPU are installed in a system. There's also the potential problem of SSDs overheating, as that area right above or below the GPU can be an airflow dead zone. To address the cooling issue, the PCB has an open cutout to allow the SSD to make contact with the GPU's heatsink via a thermal pad. With this setup, the SSD gets cooled directly by the GPU's fans. Because the heat-producing GPU is connected to the same cooler, it's also possible that this could do more harm than good. We'd have to test it to actually know, but for whatever it's worth, ASUS has shown some testing with Firmark running on the GPU and the SSD sitting at 42C. More likely than not, the main impact would be at idle, However, it being worse than uh, sitting under the GPU is unlikely. Those of you who've been around a while might remember back in about 2016 when we and most of the other media covered the Radeon Pro SSG, which is the only other GPU with attached storage we can think of, but that was a very different case. I mean, that was the GPU could access it and it was hosted on the device, so it was a uh, much different implementation because the SSDs on board were used to basically expand the memory available to the video card, but still cut past the CPU for things like professional 3D modeling work. So this is different. It's just an SSD that is hosted on the card, but is still accessed uh, the way an SSD would be accessed. So in other words, the GPU is not aware that it is playing host to the SSD when you move it to the card like this. It ends up visible to the OS like any other SSD. Uh, and the motherboard might need PCIe bifurcation enabled. That would make sense to split it between two devices. Um, so that would have to be there to address both devices simultaneously if it's working the way we think it does. The card's PCB could also have some sort of MUX chip 
but that just seems like a big cost to add to the card uh, for something that's not considered high-end to begin with, even though it's high-end prices and low-end performance. Up next, NVIDIA's next GPU, speaking of high-end prices, is the RTX 4060 Ti 16 gigabyte. Probably not eagerly awaited by anyone, but that doesn't stop them from launching it. Uh, this card is a 16 gigabyte version of the 4060 Ti. It is otherwise unchanged. It'll be available, according to these rumors, July 18th. We don't know if NVIDIA is going to be sampling the media with this one. My suspicion is no. Uh, maybe they'll prove us wrong. That'd be nice, but... It, it seems like they look at the 4060 Ti reviews where the card was universally hated and they'll say, hmm, maybe we'll just kind of silently let this one hit the market and hope that the reviews are delayed enough that people buy it before they see one. Anyway, the leak was by Megasize GPU, who's been making a name for themselves on Twitter as, as a leaker lately. Uh, although unofficial, these types of leaks have had pretty good accuracy recently. So we expect performance to be similar to the existing 8 gigabyte version of the GPU. The one possible exception is 4K, where the extra VRAM will help, and at least will help with the texture rendering. Given that it's supposed to launch, though, at a $100 premium, totaling $500 for MSRP, our expectations are not high for value. And by not high, we mean <laughs> Uh, it's going to be really bad. AMD needs to start showing up here too, though. They've been absent because it's been letting NVIDIA completely own the mid-range for this generation, and NVIDIA's only big competition has been Intel. There are zero current-gen Radeon GPUs between the $300... No, wait, the 270 It's actually $255 RX 7600 and the $900 RX 7900 XT I'm being told it's actually $720 now. AMD innovating in changing the price after launch, and they've received maximum damage, as always. So, between $255 or whatever and $720 or whatever for the prices, there is an RX 6800-sized hole right in the middle of the lineup. The price difference between the cheapest AMD GPU and the cheapest high-end one is $465. The Sapphire 6800, this one, is 460 bucks right now. Previous generation cards still exist and are generally good value while still available, but we would have expected mid-range 7000 cards to show up by this point. Now, it seems to me like we might be in some sort of new era where I actually had this in the 5600X3D review, but we cut it for time, where the companies are keeping the old generation around as a new form of low-end while dropping the prices, rather than launching a true new low end, uh, which sort of you end up with two generations of parts that coexist and are sold actively simultaneously, maybe even still in production in some cases, but no new low end entries from that new generation. So really weird market right now. Uh, at this point, if NVIDIA and AMD keep dragging their feet on value options and something affordable to keep people buying into the market and building PCs when they're new to it, Intel might be able to sneak Battle Mage out and keep capturing that market. 8-Bit Doe, is that how you say it? In partnership with SNK, is launching a basically a remake of the classic Neo Geo controller for the modern gamer's needs. It's the perfect thing to buy, use twice, and then put on your nerd shelf forever. And dust it occasionally, hopefully. 8-Bit Doe, or 8-Bit Do, is known for doing right by this kind of project. Those who really do want to be able to play classics like Double Dragon in the original way will probably get a lot of satisfaction from it. 8-Bit Doe says it spent three years on the controller's development, redesigning it from the ground up. One of the biggest design challenges was re-engineering the original Neo Geo's click-style joystick. The mechanism was no longer in use or production by anyone and 8-Bit had to go through an entire development process on that alone. A lot of what people want from a product like this is flawless replication of the original feel and sound, and that's hard to nail down. Apart from adding Bluetooth and 2.4 GHz wireless mode, other anachronistic additions include shoulder buttons and turbo functionality. It's also available in four different limited edition, the King of Fighters 97 versions, including different characters from the series. The controller is compatible with Windows, Android, the Neo Geo Mini, and it's available for pre-order for $35. We're not going to review it, but 
is kind of cool and we wanted to show it. Steam Deck maker JS Aux has a pretty cool accessory kit for the Steam Decks coming up. We actually, we've covered them in the past and this requires disassembly and reassembly of a Steam Deck, but it would allow you to get a full clear plastic shell on the device so you can have something similar to some of the N64s or the Game Boys of a past era. Uh, this thing, when Jeremy showed me the story as he was working on writing this one, what I liked the most is they include a full set of tools with it, and they also have a, a, a sped up, but otherwise basically uncut video guide, and they have a tray that they include so you can track everything. So it makes it about as easy as possible to do the teardown and reassembly for users who may have zero experience with it. Now, right off the bat, JS Aux does caution anyone who isn't comfortable with this level of disassembly because this is the kind of thing where if you're careless, you could definitely damage something. The full replacement transparent plastic shell is available in clear, purple, and brown. The last one doesn't look as bad as it sounds. The kit is available as either just the front for $36 with the uh, install kit, or as a combo with an updated version of JS Aux's transparent back for $50. The replacement backplate increases ventilation and replaces the rear buttons with a design that's more pronounced and looks easier to press. The kit also comes with all the tools you need for doing the job, including a precision screwdriver, tweezers, screw sorting tray, extra screws, and a plastic tray specifically molded to hold all the Steam Deck parts while you're working on it. And this, again, is an awesome level of care and detail to see. One of the trickiest parts will probably be getting the screen off, even with the included suction cup and the shims, and you need to bring your own heat gun or a hair dryer or something. The amount of community and aftermarket support that the Steam Deck continues to receive is indicative of its success. Even just JS Aux alone has a wide range of products for the handheld, including replacement screens, docks, fans, and RGB inserts. And another indicator of success is that there are now over 10,000 Steam verified games as compatible, uh, verified or playable on the Steam Deck according to SteamDB. And with this kind of momentum, uh, it seems like the handheld basically PC gaming market will continue to bloom because Asus with the ROG Ally, GPD has new options coming out, and then Ioneo still uh, putting out new devices as well. So we'll have to see if, if Valve can break the curse of the threes later down the road, but they've still got a Steam Deck 2 that they can do before they get to a Steam Deck 3. And finally, Intel is extending Optane by one quarter. Uh, we previously reported on Intel killing its Optane division and products. And that holds true for most of the lineup, but just the persistent memory modules will now be available one additional quarter until end of Q4. This move could be due to either excess stock in Intel's distribution network or actual sustained demand from customers. Either way, Intel's advising buyers to order it while they can. Quote, customers are recommended to secure additional units at the specified 0.44% annualized failure rate for safety stock. Intel says it'll make reasonable efforts to support last time order quantities for Optane Persistent Memory 100 series modules. And we eagerly await Wendell from Level 1 Techs giving all of us the off-label ways to make excellent use of these once they inevitably hit the secondhand market for dirt cheap. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go over to store.gamersaccess.net to grab a mod mat and again, you can get one that the full team working on the AMD documentary signed if you want to pick one of those up. And we'll see you all next time.